Welcome to the Catholic Midlife Podcast, where we address the challenges and the opportunities of midlife from a uniquely Catholic perspective. This is the time, my friends, for a deeper renewal of your Christian vocation. Come and enter into the freedom of Christ that allows you to be the person you were created to be, because there's an amazing, awesome, exciting next season of life waiting for you. Hello, and welcome to the Catholic Midlife Podcast. This is Curtis. We are continuing our Advent series, and if you can remember, way back to the second Sunday of Advent, boy, holiday time's so weird, right? It kind of dilates, but accelerates at the same time anyway. Way back then, from the second book of Peter, chapter three, we heard this. According to his promise, we await a new heavens and a new earth. Wow. That's the new creation right there. Both heaven and earth are remade and combined, and that's our eternal destiny to live there. And what are some of the implications of that? Well, one thing about that is the new heavens and new earth, that's the perfection of the kingdom of God. And we're living in the kingdom of God right now, right? Jesus talked about that a lot. And the final new creation, that's like the majestic oak, but we're more in the acorn stage. It's an imperfect stage of the kingdom of God. But what does being in the kingdom of God, I mean, what does that tell us about well, what we want to be doing now? And w- what is the kingdom of God anyway? Karen and I are going to talk about this in this episode previously broadcast And we think it's a wonderful topic. We think we're really going to love this episode. So it's our pleasure to represent this. Hello, and welcome to the Catholic Midlife Podcast. It's great to be here with you. I'm Curtis. I'm here with my fellow host, Karen. Hi, everybody. I'm happy to be here with you today. I have just returned to a trip where I was seeing a lot of family and family I hadn't had a chance to spend a lot of time with. It's the fun recently. side of the family. It is definitely <laughs> the fun side of the family. So it's always a blessing to be with them. And my cousin said to me, I don't know if my wife told you, but we have been listening to your podcast. We've listened to every episode. And so I just want to say thank you. To be honest, I don't know if his wife was making him listen or if he's enjoying the process, but... Kay and Jay, I know you're listening. Thank you so much for your support. We are honored. We are. We are indeed honored. And we're going to continue with the Advent theme. And I just want to ask you a rhetorical question. If you had to explain what the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God means, how how would you explain it? Remember John the Baptist saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is drawing near. Mm. And what would you say? say to explain it? And what would you say how you fit in? What is it you're supposed to do? What are we all supposed to be doing? That's a really hard question, Curtis. That is a very, it's it's the big question. We don't mess around here. <laughs> we don't, we just lay it out there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you could get your, your little micro tips for organizing your inbox someplace else. Mm. Okay, so Well, in the last podcast, just looking back, just briefly, I mean, we talked about Jesus. He's the he's the place now where heaven and earth come together. It's a place where God dwells. the The temple that's where God's glory resides. Jesus was just not what he was expected to be by first century Jews, because if you look at when the glory of the Lord is returning, and you look through Scripture, you can see some things that are pretty basic that they expected. They expected the covenant with Israel would be renewed and, you know, the life of the covenant would be restored. So, so, so the land would return to Israel because they needed to be a people together and a king would come and bring God's just rule. And of course the temple would be restored and the Shekinah, the, the glory of God would return to the temple. And, and the law of God would be kept from the heart by all his people. And, and these things, the oppression of Israel would end. There'd be a return from exile. Israel's God would be king of the whole world. These things were 
all part of the expectations. Right. I think I think in many ways they had the vision of what it had been like, the first covenant and the first temple. And so they were really looking for a restoration of that. And they thought of that in the terms that they had. Israel will be vindicated. Things will be set right. God will return to the temple. And a couple things that that I'm not sure people realize is they really did expect that there would be this bodily resurrection to what they called everlasting life. So all of this coming of the return of God was what they called the age to come. And this was in distinct contrast to the age they were in, which was obviously not the time when God was king of the whole world. Things were not going so well at that time. Things were not. God didn't rule. False rulers did. Death and destruction seemed to have the upper hand. They were trapped in their sins and their failure to keep the covenant, and they were in exile. And, you know, let's be honest, the righteous were not vindicated. Wrongs were not righted. And all of this was what they called the present age. So they're living in the present age, and they're looking for and waiting for the age to come. And when God comes and the reign of God is established, that's what they called the kingdom of God. And everything would be totally changed, totally transformed. And there would be this resurrection into this glorious age to come. Yeah, it sounds a lot like what we're still waiting for. It does. It does. And I think I think we can definitely appreciate and experience the hold of the present age. And yet, when Jesus came, his message was, no, the kingdom of God is here, and I'm going to tell you what it's like, and I will show you what it's like. And then in his death and resurrection, he inaugurated it and made it a reality. It's a little hard to grasp that the kingdom of God is here now. Mm-hmm. There, there's, it doesn't feel like it some days, for sure, huh? to say the least. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't. And that's what's so profound about having a Christian vision and a Christian worldview and having hope in the kingdom of God, hope in the age to come, and the eyes to see what it means for the kingdom to be a reality right now. Right, Karen. So here's the thing with God. <laughs> you, you can't get locked into what you think God's coming and God's presence is going to look mm, like. That's for sure. Uh, you certainly can't tell him what to do or when to show up. <laughs> right. It always surprises you. And this whole deal kind of reminds me of the book of Isaiah. I was reading that sweep from chapter 40 through 55. And somewhere in there, it said, well, it's all happened this way because now that it's happened in such an unexpected way, nobody can say man did this. And that really struck me as... Isaiah said that? Yeah, it's it's in there. Oh, interesting. That's really interesting. I always sort of had this question, like a long time ago, I was sort of like, how could you be in the presence of Christ and not see him for who he was. And then I got a little older in life and I had some more experiences and I learned a lot more about scripture. And then I was like, holy cow, how did anybody recognize him? It was so chaotic. How it's amazing anybody saw him for who he was. But I think the disciples were looking, they were watching And they were looking and watching without being locked into their own idea about what was going to happen. These were the people that were looking and watching. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, you know, even they, even the ones who believe that Jesus was the Messiah and commissioned by God to bring about the kingdom, they didn't expect him 
to be crucified. I mean, what it means in first century Israel when when the person is crucified is this wasn't the Messiah. This is not the age to come. The kingdom isn't really here. So I, I don't know. It reminds me of the the disciples on the road to Emmaus, right? And they're talking like, dang, we just, we really thought this was the one. We thought this was the Messiah. And he must not be because Messiahs don't get crucified. And this is what had happened a lot before with other so-called self-proclaimed messiahs who were crucified by the Romans. Well, and then Jesus opened their eyes to the scriptures yes. and explained. And that's this is what John's gospel is doing. Yes. Is it is showing the continuity mm-hmm. between the the scripture, the Old Testament, and everything that Jesus is and was. Sure. So here's how Jesus is fulfilling all those hopes and expectations you had in this way of thinking. Well, that's right, because he has to live into all the all those promises. He has to fit into the narrative that God has been working on, mm-hmm. or else he's not the Messiah. Right. And the, the thing that just it all rests on, right, is the proof that he was who he said he was, and he did what he said he was going to do in establishing the kingdom and defeating death is the resurrection. Hang on a second, Karen. I've got two questions. The first is, why is there cat hair on the fuzzy part of my microphone? <laughs> and, and this, I cannot answer that question for you. Yeah. And, and the, nobody else can either. None of the tail, our friends with tails, they're looking innocent. The, the second question is... Well, wasn't the resurrection of the dead in dispute? Wasn't that a Sadducees, Pharisees thing? And didn't you just say, oh, well, they were expecting the resurrection of the dead? Right, right, right. Okay. So th- the thing about this is there were not, not everybody at this time believed that this resurrection of the dead would happen with the age to come. But many, many people did. And there's some evidence to say that the people who didn't kind of had a political stake in not having that happen and and not having the current regime be all upended and transformed because they were part of the ruling regime and they had a stake in that. But many, many people did believe and it meant that, okay, when the age to come, the kingdom of God comes, God's people are going to be transformed into who they were meant to be, including death would be destroyed and there would be this new kind of life a new kind of life that didn't include death yeah yeah so so really it was it was a prominent theme and so you get here's the thing though they didn't expect that one person would be resurrected before and apart from everyone else so they thought this age to come thing it's all going to happen at once it's going to happen for everybody at once. And so it's pretty unexpected. Here we are witnessing the resurrection of Jesus before everybody else. Yeah. So the Messiah comes and he inaugurates the kingdom. And when it comes to some of the really big things like resurrection, he's like, okay, well, I'm just going to start us off here. (laughs) And you guys, look, I've got you covered. Don't worry. But but you guys are going to come a little later. Right. There was this new thing, which is the overlap of the kingdom of God and the age to come with the present age. And so it took some expanding of your brain to start to take that in. What does this mean? And it takes them a while, right? Because so even the disciples, just before Jesus ascends, they're like, so is now the time when the kingdom of God will come? Because they're still thinking, they're still waiting for the Romans to be overthrown and the temple to be rebuilt. And so they really have to just expand their brain to take it all in and try to understand it. Are we there yet? Are How much there? further is it? <laughs> Man, I can relate to that. I'm like, well, yeah. How about the new creation already? Right. Well, we, it is oh, already. Oh, there's the tribulations, though. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm pretty mixed feelings. <laughs> you have mixed feelings. <laughs> okay, maybe I'm not ready. Well, but here's what Jesus says when the disciples ask him, is now the time? He says, wait, because you will receive power from on high and you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. So he says, wait and see, there's something coming. There's something big coming. Jesus is forecasting Pentecost. The spirit comes down dramatically and it rests on oh, his people. Ding, 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 it rests? It Did rests. you say rests? Oh my goodness. Uh -oh. That is too shocking. <laughs> That's the big word. And it, actually in John's gospel, what he says is, and Jesus breathed on them. Yes. Just like God breathed into Adam and Eve. We're the people, I guess. We're, we're the temple. Well, that's definitely what it suggests. There's this image of fire, of wind, of God's presence being here, God's power. And, and it's definitely how the early Christians interpret it. Right. So there's that beautiful scripture from Ephesians. I think it's the second chapter where, you know, in King Jesus, all of this is fitted together and it, it grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And he basically says, you're being built up together in Christ into a place where God will dwell by the spirit. So he's saying you, the body of Christ, are a holy temple and you're the dwelling in which God lives. You're the temple of believers. And that's pretty astounding, really. I mean, basically it's saying, okay, now you're the people who live at the intersection of heaven and earth. And now you are being pulled into this new creation that is Christ and and now you are living the new creation and you're bringing it into the world. That, that's a little more profound than I better not catch you smoking behind the garage because your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> yeah, it'd be interesting to just sort of analyze all the different ways that scripture has so, been used. Dad, that's not very profound. <laughs> Go read your scripture. Oh, see, if only you'd known then what you know now. You oh, had yes. a, a snappy retort, a snappy retort. So I want to talk a little bit actually about this thing that Jesus says is, is you'll receive power from on high and you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Because there is something very specific that it meant to be a witness in that period of time. Do you, do you mind if I go off? No, I'm bit? interested. When I think of witness, I think of really evangelizing. Right. Do you, you know, yeah, that's what I think of. Yeah. Well, in these days, to be a witness meant to be a herald. So what the ancient world, what heralds would do is, you know, we've got a new king in Rome. He's been enthroned. They go out and they tell everybody, okay, you've got a new king. He's ruling over you. You need to give him your allegiance. And this was what they called the good news. The gospel. The gospel. When Caesar was proclaimed king, that was the gospel being proclaimed for the Romans. Yes. Yeah, so and I was reading somewhere, somebody made the comment, you know, we think of like, well, those people may or may not have thought that it was good news that so-and-so was ruling in <laughs> yeah. Rome. But then he said, but, you know, we don't appreciate in modern times, you know, governments were bad, but chaos and anarchy was worse. And people appreciated that at the time. So the witnesses to Christ are called to go out and make that kind of announcement. Somebody has been enthroned already as king and is ruling. Is ruling now. And that's what we believe, even though, like everyone else, what we see doesn't always match up to what we know to be true. Jesus is telling them, it's not time yet for you to see the kingdom as you expected it. It's not that time yet. For now, it's time to be a witness. Right. But it's here, right? But it's here. It's yeah. here. So 
go forth and announce it. And I just, I think I want to address a misconception. I feel like it just goes really, really deep into our philosophical and cultural roots. And I think what we think is, well, the Jews expected this earthly kingdom and Jesus came and he proclaimed a spiritual kingdom or, or, you know, a heavenly kingdom. So the Jews were looking for this transformation of space-time creation. And we think Jesus says, no, this isn't your true home. Your true home is in heaven where I'm going. And so when that's your framework, then your goal in the Christian life is to kind of get through this worldly life and go to heaven because that's where Jesus is. It, it is very hard to escape that. I, I believe it just runs through and through our culture. I, I know it's very hard for me not to think in those terms of, you know, passing the test. Yeah. Well, here's the thing, though. That's actually a dualistic perspective. And that's not what we see in the scriptures. And it's actually not what Jesus is saying, because The kingdom of God that Jesus proclaims is a heaven and earth reality. It's a heaven and earth kingdom. And and when the kingdom is fully here, there's going to be this unity of heaven and earth, and both realms will be transformed. And we are not created to leave this place. We are meant to be transformed And all of creation is meant to be transformed and heaven and earth are meant to come together. And this is what we mean when the kingdom is already here, but not yet fully revealed. How the kingdom is inaugurated in Christ, that is super unexpected. But it doesn't mean that the true kingdom is somewhere else. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense to me. Karen, at the beginning of the episode, I asked how somebody would describe <laughs> the kingdom of heaven and what, what is it we're supposed to do? What What about witness? Sure. Like, what does it mean to be a witness? Yes. Yeah. Well, I guess I'd say a couple things. And, and the first one I think is really interesting. And it comes from Philippians, Paul's letter to Philippi, where Paul calls the Christians citizens of heaven, citizens of heaven. And oh, wait a minute. That means I live in heaven. Yeah. How do I get, to, how how do do I I get, get that there? citizenship? <laughs> well, Paul knows that the analogy that is going to be assumed is being a citizen of Rome because Philippi was a Roman colony and there were, there were a lot of Roman citizens there. They weren't interested in leaving Philippi and going to Rome, but they were agents and representatives of Rome in Philippi. It was your job to bring Roman culture, Roman rule, Roman influence to wherever you were living. And and if things got dicey, people didn't leave and go back to Rome. So Paul is saying, you're a citizen of heaven. You're an agent. You're a representative of heaven. You're working to promote God's influence, God's culture, God's rule God's justice, God's mercy, wherever you are. And Paul also says, and, because he knows, right, things are not, we're still dealing with the remnants of the present age. So also we're waiting for the Lord, King Jesus, to come from heaven and fulfill and finish what he's already begun. So part of being a witness, I think, is taking on the agency and being the representative wherever we are. Wow. Come, Lord Jesus, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in in heaven. heaven. As it is in heaven. Karen, that was a great summary. Thank you so much. I want to invite our listeners to visit our website, thecatholicmidlife.com, and look for the big orange buttons we have rebooked or we've opened a new round of self-compassion courses for men and for women. And we would love for you to join us and learn to practice the skill, which is it's so useful. And it's, it's so useful in, in helping us live our lives and, and be witnesses. Mm-hmm. 
So we will see you next week. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for being here with us. The Catholic Midlife Podcast is for anyone that wants to receive the abundance of life that God has for each one of us. Take a moment right now to tell a friend about us.